Hello, it's my pleasure to tackle this motion in the presence of cerebral microbleeds, antithrombotic therapy should be avoided. My name is David Waring, I'm Professor of Neurology at the UCL Queen Square Institute of Neurology. These are my declarations of interest. So I just wanted to clarify the question first of all. Um, I'd like to clarify the population that we're talking about here is patients with recent ischemic stroke or TIA. In the presence of microbleeds, antithrombotic therapy should be avoided. And I will be arguing against the motion. In other words, that antithrombotic therapy should not be avoided in such patients. So let me just set the scene with some background. As we've heard, this is a common clinical dilemma. Now that we're routinely using blood sensitive sequences uh, that can detect microbleeds, we're often finding these lesions. So we have a patient with ischemic stroke or a TIA, their MRI shows microbleeds. And we know that uh, in patients with cerebral ischemia, that anticoagulants and antiplatelet drugs are very effective in reducing the risk of further ischemic events, but they can increase the risk of bleeding. And the most catastrophic form of bleeding and the most feared complication of antithrombotic agents is intracranial hemorrhage. And the question is, do microbleeds influence the risk of intracranial hemorrhage? And can they be useful in selecting patients for treatment? But just to remind us, microbleeds are small black dots seen on T2 star weighted MRI or other sequences that are sensitive to magnetic susceptibility. And we know histologically from this nice study from the Boston group that microbleeds generally correspond to small bleeds from small vessels within the brain. So they are a marker of previous bleeding events within the brain. This leads us to a very simple hypothesis that microbleeds are a marker of bleeding prone arteriopathies. And the idea is that um, in patients with antithrombotic therapy, the normal coagulation cascade is inhibited. So what normally would be a small extravasation of blood cells from a small vessel, in the presence of anticoagulants or antiplatelet drugs, this extravasation isn't sealed off in the normal way and a cerebral microbleed therefore becomes a macroscopic symptomatic intracerebral hemorrhage, which is the most feared complication of antithrombotic agents. So let's just look at the evidence for this hypothesis in respect of the motion that we're addressing. So this is a meta-analysis undertaken by Duncan Wilson and colleagues uh, about several years ago, where we looked at 5,000 patients in 15 studies. It was an aggregate level meta-analysis of patients with ischemic stroke and TIA, mostly treated with antiplatelet drugs. And what you can see here is the risk ratio of both ischemic stroke which is the dark bars and intracerebral hemorrhage, which is the lighter bars. And what we can see is that as the microbleed count increases, the risk of ischemic stroke increases slightly, but the, the risk of intracranial hemorrhage increases much more dramatically. But of course, we're most interested in absolute risks, not relative risks. So let's look at what happens. And in fact, at all microbleed counts in this meta-analysis, the risk of ischemic stroke was higher than that of intracerebral hemorrhage. But note that when we get to more than five microbleeds here that I've outlined, the risk of intracerebral hemorrhage approaches that risk of ischemic stroke. So what other data do we have? Well, this was a study that we did in patients with atrial fibrillation treated with oral anticoagulants at around 80 hospitals in the United Kingdom, 1,500 patients. And what we found was that once again, microbleeds were associated with an increased risk of recurrent ischemic stroke and an increased risk of symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage. But what I want to draw your attention to is that the risk of recurrent ischemic stroke is higher than that of intracranial hemorrhage regardless of the number of microbleeds. But this study only had 14 hemorrhage outcome events, and there weren't many patients with a large number of cerebral microbleeds, which are those that cause the most clinical concern. So we need larger scale data. The key question is, do a large burden of microbleeds or particular anatomical patterns 
identify patients with ischemic stroke or TIA who have a higher absolute risk of intracranial hemorrhage than of ischemic stroke when given antithrombotic drugs, because only then would it be reasonable to consider avoiding antithrombotic drugs because of the risk of met harm to our patient. So let's look at some larger scale data. This is the Microbleeds International Collaborative Network, which was established some years ago. And this looked at published data addressing this topic of microbleeds and stroke risk. Through a systematic review and looking at known collaborative networks, we included 38 studies in this large pooled analysis, all with a low risk of bias. We included over 20,000 participants with a mean age of 70, 42% women, all with recent ischemic stroke or TIA. Nearly 8,000 were taking oral anticoagulants and nearly 12,000 participants were taking antiplatelet drugs. And you can see the global reach of this collaboration covering most uh, much of the world. Our primary outcome events that are important in deciding on antithrombotic therapy were the composite of any symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage or ischemic stroke, symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage, and symptomatic ischemic stroke considered separately. So let's look at these results. We had microbleeds in 5,649 participants, that's 28%, which is similar to what one would expect in ischemic stroke and TIA cohorts. You can see that we had patients with more than five, more than 10, and even more than 20 microbleeds in reasonable numbers. We had 35,000 patient years of follow-up, median of 1.34 years, and there were nearly 1,500 composite events, over 1,000 ischemic strokes, and 189 intracranial hemorrhages. So this is powerful data to look at this question. Let's look at the results for the primary outcomes according to microbleed presence. Well, you can see that for the composite outcome of both ischemic and hemorrhagic stroke, microbleeds increased this risk with a hazard ratio of 1.35. They were also associated with an increased risk of intracranial hemorrhage and an increased risk of ischemic stroke. And you can see that given these large numbers, we were able to adjust for a large number of confounding factors in this analysis. Now, the really interesting finding is let's look at these primary outcomes according to microbleed burden. And we can see that as the microbleed count increases, going through the blue line up to the orange line, there is an increased risk of the composite outcome. There is an increased risk of intracranial hemorrhage, particularly you can see separation of the curve at five microbleeds with an adjusted hazard ratio of 4.55. And there's an increased risk of ischemic stroke, which is also a graded increase as the number of microbleeds increases. What we're really interested in, of course, is the absolute risks. And you won't be able to read all the results here, and I'm going to go through them briefly just now. The absolute risks of intracranial hemorrhage and of ischemic stroke. Essentially, the main result here was that the absolute risk of ischemic stroke always exceeded that of intracranial hemorrhage and quite substantially. So for example, with more than 20 microbleeds, you can see that the risk of ischemic stroke was 73 per thousand patient years, whereas that of intracranial hemorrhage was 39 per thousand patient years, almost a doubling of the risk of ischemic stroke in comparison to intracranial hemorrhage. This finding was the case for all microbleed distributions, be that low bar, deep, mixed, or strictly low bar. And there was no interaction between the type of antithrombotic drug, ethnicity, and microbleeds for any of these outcomes. The results were very similar for those taking oral anticoagulants. I won't go through those in detail, but they were consistent with the whole cohort. So in summary, in patients with recent ischemic stroke or transit ischemic attack, microbleeds are associated with a greater relative hazard for subsequent intracranial hemorrhage than for ischemic stroke. But the very robust finding in this large study is that the absolute risk of ischemic stroke is higher than that of intracranial hemorrhage. And importantly, this is regardless of microbleed presence, anatomical distribution or burden. So the implications of this are that microbleeds can inform us regarding the hazard of intracranial hemorrhage 
in patients with recent ischemic stroke or TIA treated with antithrombotic drugs, that is antiplatelet drugs and anticoagulant drugs, but the available evidence does not support withholding antithrombotic treatment because of cerebral microbleeds, regardless of the burden or anatomical distribution. So is the, in the presence of cerebral microbleeds, antithrombotic therapy should be avoided. The answer most emphatically is no, because patients, even when treated with antithrombotic drugs, are at a very substantially higher risk of ischemic stroke than they are at risk of intracranial hemorrhage. And patients can still benefit from antithrombotic therapy. The paper with more detail of these observations was published in Lancet Neurology last year and it's open access so it can be freely um, accessed to look in more detail at these results. I'd like to thank the Microbeads International Collaborative Network and there's a list of collaborators for all of the participating cohorts. I'd also like to sincerely thank my funders, particularly including the British Heart Foundation and the Stroke Association, as well as many other collaborators. And with that, I thank you for your attention and will be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much indeed.